Good evening. I'm Jake Silverstein. I'm the editor of Texas Monthly, and we're very happy to be here with you tonight uh, and to bring you this event as, as part of this special issue that we did on the topic of drought and water in Texas. I want to start by thanking all of you, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit so y'all can uh, finish sitting down there. Thanking all of you for being here. Uh, as some of you may have heard, we, we, uh, we had to move to a larger venue. There was such an enthusiastic response to this event. And, and that is an incredibly encouraging sign, uh, because this is such an important issue, that we did have such strong response to this. And so thank you all very much for being here with us tonight. Um, you know, I think we all accept here in this room that we have a crisis on our hands when it comes to water and drought. And if there was any doubt about that last year, uh, the drought last year cleared that up. It was a devastating drought, as we all know, 14.8 inches of rain fell across the state. But if there was any positive outcome to be found in that, any silver lining, it's that the drought has focused more people uh, on the challenges that we face. It certainly focused us at the magazine. We've devoted this entire July issue, you see the cover up there on the screen, to the drought, and we collaborated also with our friends at KUT, the radio station here in Austin, and State Impact Texas to create an hour-long radio documentary on the subject. And one of the things that, that our issue and that hour-long documentary really makes clear is that in Texas, we're never gonna be free of the, the problem of drought. Uh, we went back in this issue 4,000 years to look at how the drought may have impacted uh, our, our ancestors in this land, and then we cycled forward to the drought of record, the 1950s drought, uh, which prompted the last big surge of water planning and development in Texas. And I think the question before us is whether last year's drought, the worst single year drought in Texas in recorded history, will have the same sort of stimulative effect that the 1950s drought. Will we be moved to act again in those same big ways? And that's why we're here tonight. Uh, we accept that we have this crisis on our hands, and so now the question is, what are we gonna do? What changes do we need to make, and how do we summon the political will to make those changes? So, so we convene this panel, these, these folks here to my right, to talk specifically about solutions. We know how bad it is, and because you are all here tonight, I take that as an indication that you do as well. So what is the way or the ways forward? Our, our panelists are a group of people that are, are well positioned to try to answer that question. These are people who've been collectively working on this issue for many decades. Uh, it's a dream team, if you will, of, of water policy and planning since it's the summer of the Olympics. These are, uh, these are some of the state's biggest brains when it comes to this subject. And what we asked each one of them to do is to come prepared with one solution um, for our water, our, our water crisis. And after we hear from them, we're gonna kind of walk down the row hearing from them about, uh, about their solutions. We will then have some moderated discussion with them. So let's begin by, by meeting the panelists. Uh, all the way down there at the end, I'm gonna start at the right and come back toward me. We have Nate Blakesley, who's the senior editor at Texas Monthly. Uh, Nate uh, has been with the magazine since 2006, and in addition to having written the book Tulia, Race, Cocaine, and Corruption in a Small Texas Town, Nate covers a lot of uh, environment and energy issues for us at the magazine and wrote a story in this particular issue about the state water plan. Nate will be moderating this discussion. Uh, sitting next to Nate is Texas Commissioner of Agriculture Todd Staples. Uh, as the 11th Commissioner of Agriculture, Todd Staples remains diligent in his efforts to promote agriculture while prioritizing private sector job creation and economic development. During his time as a state representative, state senator, and now agriculture commissioner, he has advocated a water plan that includes the creation of new infrastructure and conservation. Sitting to the left of the commissioner is the state director of the Nature Conservancy, Laura Huffman. Ms. Huffman heads a team of 80 plus scientists, conservation experts, and support staff whose work protects the integrity of some of Texas's most iconic places, and Austin native, she is a trusted national voice of the Nature Conservancy. Mr. Robert R. Puente, the president and CEO of the San Antonio Water System is here. He leads one of the nation's largest utilities delivering water and wastewater services to more than 16, to, to more than 1.6 million consumers developing new water resources, continuing infrastructure upgrades, and building regional partnerships. Prior to coming to SAWS, Puente served in the Texas House of Representatives from 1991 to 2008 and was chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. And then we have next to him another, uh, another refugee from the State House, right? <laughs> Senator Kip Averitt, a former Texas legislator and the founder of Averitt and Associates, served for more than 17 years in the Texas legislature and three sessions as chair of the Senate Natural Resources Committee. In 2010, he opened Averitt and Associates Consulting. He is recognized for his expertise and leadership on water policy and water conservation. And last, 
Andrew Sansom, the executive director of the Texas River Systems Institute. Sansom is a former executive director of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. His articles have appeared in Texas Parks and Wildlife, Texas Monthly, Cowboys and Indians, Texas Highways, and the Texas Observer. He is also the author of five books. Please help me in welcoming all of these fine people. And uh, before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Please do silence your cell phones, but please don't hesitate to use them. If you want to tweet about what you hear tonight, the ideas and things that are being set up here, please do, and I would encourage you to use the hashtag TXWater, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then that's cool too. <laughs> uh, if you do, we'll be rounding up some of these tweets tomorrow to, uh, to share with, with folks on, on our website. And lastly, I want to take just a final moment to thank our sponsors who have made tonight's event possible, Texas A&M University, San Antonio Water System, and the LBJ Presidential Library. There's more information about all three of these sponsors in your program, and we're very grateful to them for their support. And I want to thank once again KUT for being a great partner on the radio program that we did, and actually that show will be re-aired tonight uh, from 8 to 9 p.m., so you can catch it on the drive home from this event. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Nate now to, to get us started. <clears throat> thank you, Jake, and uh, let me just say also how pleased I am that so many people have, have come tonight and how grateful I am, especially to our panelists uh, for taking uh, the time to be here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be up here with a panel of such uh, distinguished and talented people. Um, as Jake said, we're going to start uh, with each panelist offering their idea of, of one solution or more um, to the crisis that we face in water with Texas, and we're going to start here uh, to my left uh, with Commissioner Todd Staples. Thank you, Nate. It's an honor to be here tonight with each of you and certainly the distinguished panelists who have a long history of problem solving. I think as we begin the discussion tonight that uh, it's important to note that while the crisis resulting from the drought that we have experienced uh, might have been a surprise to millions and millions of Texans, it was not a surprise to the water planners and the water managers who work hard every day to make certain that we Texans have the water capacity that we need. Uh, the result of the drought was not a surprise to the farmers and ranchers that are a part uh, of the Texas economy to the tune of $100 billion economically annually. When we have a shortage of water, agriculture suffers first and agriculture suffers worst. So we know that there is a, a crisis in the state in regard to not having the water availability to meet the needs of the projected growth of Texas and not having the water that we need uh, in times of drought today. So when we think about water policy, uh, I think it's also an important concept to recognize that the state of Texas does not have one single water customer. Municipalities have water customers. Water planning uh, groups have water customers. But the state doesn't, but the state does have a role in partnership and in planning. So I think there's three steps that, that, that we need to implement to meet the water demands that we have. Uh, conservation, construction, and collaboration. We have some outstanding results of water conservation today that we're gonna get the chance to discuss tonight. Uh, construction meaning everything needs to be on the table, I believe, in order to meet the needs of a growing state. And then uh, collaboration and developing partnerships like uh, um, the Sabine River Authority and LNVA that's on the table today, Midland, Abilene, and San Angelo. Uh, we have some great concepts that are there. And when I mention collaboration, I'm not mentioning taxation. So I think that might be a good topic that we can get in tonight as we look to solve our water problems. I'm sure we will. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and next, uh, to his left, we have Laura Huffman, the State Director of the Nature Conservancy. Thank you, Nate. And I just want to recognize and thank the Texas Monthly for taking on this issue. As they were writing the issue, we were actually experiencing some rainfall in Texas, uh, which I, originally I thought would not be helpful to the cause of writing about water, but ultimately I think the magazine uh, got even deeper into the issue because it wasn't just a drought story. So uh, this will come as no surprise. The one idea that I'm going to put out there is conservation. It is um, easily the single most cost-effective way that we can cultivate future water supplies. And interestingly, our state water plan already recognizes that. And for those of you that don't know, the state of Texas, unlike many states, has actually gone to the trouble to write a water plan 
so that we can look out into the future, recognize that our population is doubling from 25 million to 50 million, and start articulating ways that we can provide fresh water to fuel our economies, to serve our cities, but also to keep our rivers and streams and lakes and aquifers healthy. Conservation is uh, gonna be 25% of that future water supply. It'll represent one of the single largest blocks in terms of strategy, and the thing about it is, it's the lowest hanging fruit on the tree. So from our perspective at the Nature Conservancy, it's the place to start, but there is a way to have this conversation that would be really, really healthy, and there's a way to have this conversation that would pit one water use against another. And the three major users of water in the state of Texas are agriculture, cities, which are growing and growing quickly, and then energy and industry. And within each of those sectors, we have to figure out what the best conservation strategies are, and then each sector has to start worrying about solving each other's problems. And I'll just give you a quick example of how that might look. Agricultural all over the world is by far the highest water user. Globally, about 70% of all water that is used is used to grow food. And in Texas, that's at about 60%. Uh, the water losses are awfully high in agriculture. And it has a lot to do with outdated irrigation equipment and channel lining and things like that. If we are able to reduce the water losses, conserve the water that's used in agriculture, we can recapture the single largest block of water. That should incent the energy industry and incent cities to work with agriculture to recapture those supplies so that they're available for our growing population. So we see lots of opportunities for this to be a productive conversation for the state and to recognize that as we grow, we simply can't afford to pit energy against cities, against agriculture. The fact is, our growing state and our growing population are gonna to wanna to do three things, eat, drink, and turn the lights on. And so our job is to optimize amongst those water users. Thank you, Laura. Now let's hear from uh, Representative Puente. Well, thank you, and first of all, thank you to Texas Monthly also for the opportunity to speak to y'all. And I also want to take a, a moment to uh, recognize uh, three of my board members that are here uh, also wanting to learn about what's going on in Texas, Roberto Anguiano, Sam Luna, and Louis Rowe. So uh, they're my bosses, so um, <laughs> I, 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 hopefully I do very well right now. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing is about solutions uh, to a crisis. Uh, in my opinion, and I really believe that San Antonio has done a lot of things that we are very proud of, of, of in San Antonio, and so we in San Antonio uh, do not have a crisis. So, the, so the, the part of the solution is never to get to a point where you have a crisis. So what we've done in San Antonio is essentially four things. That's water conservation, a diverse water supply, uh, managing the supply that you do have, and innovation, uh, water conservation. Over the past 25 years, San Antonio has grown by 67%. We are using the same amount of water as we did 25 years ago. That's water conservation. Uh, we do not retrofit toilet. We do not retrofit schools with toilets in San Antonio. We retrofit entire school districts. We have uh, water conservation programs not just for homeowners, residential, but large-scale commercial users. Coca-Cola, Frito Lay, Toyota, Microsoft. These are all companies that have as part of their ethic, part of their business model, is water conservation. A lot of a lot of that was done in collaboration with SAWS, where we actually paid, gave these. Fortune 500 companies money uh, to have water conservation programs in place and have a, a situation where they actually benefit financially from these water conservation programs. So our philosophy there, our business model there at SAWS is to convince our, con our customers to buy less of our product. Convince our customers by to buy less of our product. And we have found out that that actually helps in the long run because then you don't have to pay for an additional water supply or the water supply that you do have coming in, you can push out to later years. Water supply, you need water. You can't just uh, conserve your way uh, out of a problem or uh, you really have to bring in more water supply. So what we're doing in San Antonio is not only maximizing the use of our Edgeworth aquifer by, for example, storing it in wet years underground in another aquifer in South Bear County, reusing that water. San Antonio has the largest direct recycle system in the nation but by getting additional water supplies. Right now, we are currently spending money on a desalinization plant that should be online by 2016. We are also putting out a request for proposals, just like you would for paper clips. What is the best buy to bring in additional water uh, supply 
to San Antonio, up to 50,000 acre feet. We had four proposals that came in. We are currently evaluating them and we'll negotiate with, with them to try to get the best offer to San Antonio. So you do need additional water supplies. How do you manage that water? You can't just have water restrictions when there's a drought. It'll never work. So you have to have an ethic. You have to have education built in to your rates, built into your community involvement so that the consumers, your, your rate payers, know that water conservation is part of an everyday life. All of you have friends or family in San Antonio. I challenge you to call them and ask them what habits have they changed in the last 25 years to have this water conservation ethic. And they'll probably tell you, I don't know, not really anything, because it's been such a part of their lives through education that we really have hit the mark on water conservation. I think we're very good innovators of water conservation. <clears throat> So we get uh, on water conservation. So we get to innovation. And it's not just um, um, innovation in the sense of, of what can you do better for that ratepayer dollar. In San Antonio, as I mentioned, we have the largest uh, direct recycled water system. We have an ASR, underground storage of, of, of our water supply, where in, during wet years or during the spring or the fall when there's not such a demand, we uh, put water, Edwards water, we pipe it downhill, and, and down into an underground aquifer. Uh, we have a permit of amount of water we can get out of the Edwards, and if we uh, don't use that permit for that year, then we lose it, so we want to uh, roll it into the next year. And the way you manage your supply, we have a very good program where we tell our, our ratepayers we're about to go into a drought stage, and if they, uh, when they hear that message, they cut back. And over a summertime, we have noticed that the cutback is as much as the city of Corpus Christi uses or the city of Plano uses. So it works in San Antonio. Thank you, Representative. Uh, now let's hear from Senator Averitt. <clears throat> our, our topic tonight is solutions for the looming water crisis in Texas. We need a better prayer committee. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I think he was asking me to get down on my knees. <laughs> I, I can't volunteer for that job. Um, we, we're blessed in, in this state. We have had some forward-thinking leaders um, here in Austin and uh, recognizing how our state population continues to grow at a very rapid rate and how our water supplies uh, are actually diminishing. And so uh, when our uh, legislative leaders uh, several years ago decided to tackle the problem, they came up with Senate Bill 1, the author of which, the, uh, I, the granddaddy of Senate Bill 1, I, I'd say the father of, but he's too old, uh, <laughs> Sen Senator Buster Brown, who's sitting right here on the front row, wrote and passed Senate Bill 1, which contained um, a process for our state to plan for our future water needs. Did you vote for that, Lousy yes, Bill? Yes, I was forced to. Okay. <laughs> I was too. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's a, it, was, it was a great plan, uh, and, and with, despite all of the warts and the criticisms that you might hear about the state water plan, it's the best in the country. It's very forward-thinking, and it is a, an outstanding step for our state to be prepared as our state grows in population. Um, those folks in the future are going to require water just as desperately as we do today, uh, and it's up to us to make sure that they have affordable, clean, and a and uh, plentiful supplies of water. So our state water plan is the, the model for how to approach solving that problem. And one of the primary components of how we are going to meet our future needs 50 years out into the future is a strategy called conservation. And if you Google conservation, you will find the definition says something nice that somebody else can do. <laughs> It's outside of San Antonio, conservation is a very vague concept. And the folks who are charged with providing water for our future generations cannot depend on a vague and squishy concept of conservation when they're planning for providing that water. They have to know where their water is going to come from. They have to know for sure that the water is going to be there for the citizens when they need it. And so without uh, a strong grasp of the reality of how conservation can be a source of water, they turn to 
infrastructure projects, reservoirs, uh, pipelines, desal plants, reuse projects, and things of that nature. And that's very understandable. So what I think our state needs to be doing uh, is putting a, uh, a concrete, uh, 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 tangible face on conservation. And you do that by taking the approach and the attitude that they have in San Antonio, and that is the water you don't buy is worth something. In other words, if, you're not, if you don't need it, if you don't have to buy it, you're saving yourself a lot of money. And in the, in the macro sense at SAWS, they're looking for, you know, uh, future generations, uh, a lot of water to, for a growing population. And I correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but you're using approximately the same amount of water in San Antonio that you were using in 1980. Correct, yes. Uh, you're, a, you're not a senator anymore, so I cannot, so I can correct you, but you're right. Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and by the way, I just said that in my comments, so yeah. maybe you weren't listening. <laughs> thank you, Robert. <laughs> but the fact is, uh, when, you take the, when you're taking the issue uh, seriously, uh, conservation is a legitimate source of water just as much, just as valid as a new lake or a new desal plant or anything of that. And when you put the economics to it, uh, I, I think that's where our state uh, is lacking so far. Uh, we need to have that attitude of uh, taking a business-like approach to conservation. Thank you, Senator. Uh, that just leaves Andy. And Andy, please don't say conservation because it's been said four times over. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I can't let the moment pass by not saying that since you are not a senator anymore, I don't have to get down on my knees. <laughs> Striking out. I think the first thing that we have to recognize is that when the drought of the 50s, which is basically how we began all of our modern water policies, occurred, most people in Texas lived in small towns. They lived on farms or ranches. They had relatives that owned farms or ranches. And so the drought was up close and personal. Today, most of our citizens, virtually all of them, live in urban areas. And so as long as the water is running in the bathroom or in the kitchen, there's not a perception that we have a problem. This is a very big deal. We're going to have twice as many people in Texas in the next 50 years or so and yet we have already given permission for more water to be withdrawn from many of our rivers than is actually in them. And the most important thing we have to do is to make sure that we do everything possible. And I, too, express my appreciation to the Texas Monthly for helping to have our citizens understand the consequences of this issue. I agree with everything that's been said about the Texas Water Plan, but I would, I would have to say that we can't simply believe that we can build our way out of this problem. We have to embrace a much broader suite of policy issues to, to make this future that we hope for our children come about. For example, we treat surface water and groundwater in Texas totally differently. It's almost as if they were completely different substances. And this is not an issue that ultimately will pit government against our people. It's going to pit private citizens against private citizens, both of whom believe, because the state policy allows them to, that they own the same water. And so we have to find a way to reconcile the differences in law and policy that we treat water and surf, uh, groundwater and surface water. We have an allocation system of water rights in Texas that actually has its origins when we were a colony of Spain. And we, may, we bear absolutely no resemblance to that system, and we've got to take a look at how we allocate water and give permission for its use that has a greater uh, recognition of the state, society, and economy as it is today. I won't, uh, because so much has been said about conservation, I won't spend a lot of time on it except to say that we waste too much water, San Antonio has reduced its consumption by over 40% per capita, and yet we still have cities in Texas where consumption per capita is increasing. But one of the things that is often not recognized that San Antonio has also done is to pay private landowners in important watersheds outside the city, aquifer recharge areas, 
to give up their development rights to protect those important parts of the water and hydrologic system. The, the Texas Water Plan pays attention, a little bit of attention to the issue, but every watershed, every recharge area, and all the most important uh, initial parts of the watershed where the first raindrops fall are on private land in Texas. And we have to find a way to help private landowners protect those resources in order to protect the water system. Finally, as we look for solutions, and I believe that they are there, there is water there for us if we'll just find the resolve to go after it and to develop enlightened policy to provide it, we can't forget the environment. These two gentlemen up here who served in the legislature have helped for the first time provide protection for those flows in our rivers and streams and into our bays and estuaries that are critical to those aquatic ecosystems. And yet, so far, the state has done an extremely poor job in implementing that law in order to assure that while we provide sufficient water for our economic prosperity in the future, we do not forget that the environment is also completely dependent on continued supplies of water. <clears throat> thank you, Andy, and thank you, all, all the panelists. <laughs> I think we've already heard some wonderful ideas and we could have given you each 15 minutes and it still would have been just as interesting uh, as it was. But let's see now if we can get some interesting uh, the back and forth going between the panelists. Um, I was having coffee uh, this morning with a friend of mine and uh, who follows water issues pretty closely and he gave me a, a sort of a pop quiz. He asked me, in what year did I think the people of Texas use more water? 1974 or 2009? And I'm not the kind of moderator that's going to make you friendly, fine people answer a question like that. I'll just tell you the answer that I gave, which was the wrong one. I knew that there were twice as many people living in Texas now as there were in 1974, so I said 2009. And he said no. He said and we actually used more water in 1974. And the reason is, as Laura pointed out, that the size of our cities has never really been the primary driver of water use in Texas. It has been agriculture, the number of irrigated acres. And in 1974, there were a lot more irrigated acres than there are today. Um, and the other thing that has happened uh, is that industry has become more efficient in the way they use water, chiefly because water became more expensive. And I thought to myself, what a great devil's advocate question to begin our panel discussion with. Does that mean that we don't really need uh, to build the $53 billion worth of projects in the state water plan? In other words, if, if the population of this state has just doubled in the last four decades, and we are still using roughly the same amount of water we did in 1974, is there a crisis? Do we need to do what the water plan tells us to do? And I'll throw that out there to anybody that wants to jump on that. If that's yeah, represented. Um, I agree with, well, I don't know if I agree with, I, I believe that there is not a water crisis in the state of Texas. Uh, I think there's plenty of water out there. It's just politically impossible to move that water either from uh, East Texas to the West because of interbasin transfers or, be, or from a rural area to a city because of groundwater districts. So it is, it is a, uh, and Jake mentioned that we need the political will to do this and that's what is, is necessary, the political will. This doesn't mean take the water away from the rural areas, they still need water. Uh, but find ways that allow the movement of excess water uh, to, to the cities that, that need it. Demand that the cities do some type of conservation uh, to justify that movement. So um, w w in my opinion, uh, I don't know what specific projects uh, you may be referring to in the state water plan, uh, but a lot of it can be either postponed uh, or just not done at all if we are able to manage our water supply uh, in a much better way. Um, and uh, I think we're doing that in San Antonio. Other cities are doing it also. Uh, there is a rate base that is needed, and San Antonio is big enough to where it can do a lot of these things. A lot of the smaller cities, uh, and by the way, those are the ones that got in serious, serious problems this last drought, and that was a crisis for them. But they were very, there were much smaller cities that did not have the rate base to do a lot of these things. So, in my opinion, there is a lot of water out there. It, there's political problems with solving these problems that we have. Let's stay on that for just a minute because I think that's an important point and I'm glad you brought it up so early. Senator Averett, you and I discussed a little bit the politics of interbasin transfers, which means moving water from one river basin to another. 
Can you tell us a little bit about why that's controversial and a little bit of the history of that? Well, I sure can. I, I actually had a bill uh, a few sessions ago to do away with the junior water rights provision in Senate Bill 1. Buster. <laughs> and Todd Staples killed me. He slaughtered me. You're welcome. He defeated welcome. me on the floor. He, 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 he killed me. I, I saved you from yourself. He saved He did. <laughs> Literally, he did save me. Senator, tell, tell the audience what you mean by the junior water rights provision. Well, the junior water rights provision in Senate Bill 1 simply says that uh, if you are transferring water from one basin, one river basin to another river basin, that water loses all of its uh, uh, senior priority. And uh, it doesn't say you can't transfer. It just says if you do it, uh, that water it becomes the last priority, which means in a time of drought, that that uh, water is the first to be cut off. So in a, sen in, in, in a sense, it makes the water virtually useless to somebody who needs a reliable supply of water because that'll be the first water that's uh, cut off. So uh, by, by having that uh, barrier that has been mentioned before, that, that uh, it prohibits, it doesn't prohibit, it, uh, it retards the transfer of water from water rich Texas to water poor Texas. And um, um, so that, that's the, the situation that we're in right now. And I know that there are, there are uh, uh, Commissioner Staples, you can help me with this, uh, far more knowledgeable about it than I am, but uh, there are efforts about how to uh, contractually work uh, um, deals so that that, that uh, particular provision doesn't interfere. In fact, the wisdom of the Senate saw that 30 to 1 in the House, unfortunately, failed to catch that vision when we were there working on that legislation. I wasn't the one, was I? <laughs> uh, there are a couple of things with my friend Senator Averett and Representative Puente that I, I see it a little bit differently. Uh, I believe that we do have a crisis in Texas today. I think the fact that we had over $8 billion losses in agriculture and forestry alone, I think the fact that we had many municipalities that required emergency measures to go in and um, lower their water intake out of their reservoir, uh, recognizes that in a, in a drought of record that we don't have the water resources that we need, and it impairs us financially, it, imp it, it, it impairs food production, it, it impairs job growth, it impairs businesses from investing when there is a fear that that water won't be available. San Antonio has done a great job on water conservation. Uh, Tarrant Regional and Dallas as well, I believe, have been able to postpone uh, planned infrastructure projects because of positive results of conservation. So conservation is looked at as, as an area that's not going to yield what it's promised, but we have tangible results in North Texas and San Antonio. Texas Water <coughs> Smart arose from private industry coming forward and saying, we want to be a part of this solution, and there are real results. Um, the issue of interbasin transfers, we have had many interbasin transfers in the state of Texas. Prior to the law that formalized the junior water rights provision, the Water Commission required uh, many of those transfers to be junior to those existing water rights. I would submit to you that the only reason that the junior water rights provision would be a problem is because there's not enough water to transfer out of that basin to begin with. So if you move water from one basin to the other and the junior provision becomes a problem because of the lack of certainty of that water in times of, of drought, that means you probably shouldn't be moving it because who in here this evening or who in any part of Texas would want to say, okay, take what little I have and give it to someone else and then I'll be the one to suffer. So the way we have to solve this is by growing our way out of it, using these concepts that have been identified here tonight, and by building the infrastructure that works when we do have an available supply. Um, Sabine River Authority has about, what did your article say, 1.8 million what? acre feet a year? Toledo Bend Reservoir, 1.8 billion gallons over the dam, and almost completely unallocated every single day. And today... Uh, Sabine River Authority is working with the LNVA for an interbasin transfer with the junior water rights provision that we have in place. 
the recognizing when we have enough water, you can move that water. And I believe that the, the work that we did on the contractual movement would give people a lot, a lot of extra comfort there as well. So there, there are ways to get it done. Nate, I'll just comment sure. on your uh, your friend's challenge during coffee this morning. You know, the thing about it is I worry about people that try to articulate just a simple answer to this problem. You know, if we just do this. The state's water plan has already answered that question. The state's water plan already recognizes that the the fundamental dynamic we're solving against is a growing population. So right now, 26% of the water that's used is used to fuel our municipalities. By 2060, it's going to be 38%. Uh, ag is going to go from 57 to 40 percent. So the water plan itself recognizes that we're going to shift how we use water in the state of Texas a little bit away from ag and more towards energy in cities. And that's an obvious shift. As cities grow, they're going to need more energy. And I think one thing that just cannot be emphasized enough is the water plan has also calcula calculated the cost of doing nothing. And the cost of doing nothing is $116 billion a year to the Texas economy. And of course, what that means is that by 2060, if we haven't addressed some of these tough issues, our economy is crashing because industry and businesses don't have adequate access to fresh water. So I think those are important things to remember. It's a complicated problem, but we already know what the cost of doing nothing is. Well, let's say we, we've established here, at least amongst ourselves, that there are at least some worthy projects amongst the 53 billion and they ought to be built. Let's talk for a minute about how we ought to pay for them. And just let's take a quick poll just by a show of hands. Are there any of our panelists who believe that we can build what we need to build without a new revenue source, which is to say without a new tax or fee levied by the legislature collected by the state of Texas? There's one. Anybody else? Okay, Commissioner, that that leaves you to explain how we're going to do that. That's I think <laughs> Glad to have this opportunity tonight. I think this is a good opportunity to point out uh, one of the axioms of this business, and that is that water flows uphill to money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, we have, since the 1950s, we have volumes of reservoirs that have been built in the Lone Star State. We have about 180-something major water supply reservoirs today. That was done without a tax on the taxpayers of Texas. And the reason why is because most of those projects were locally funded, locally sponsored. Now, there have been federal participation. We recognize that. There is state participation today, and we recognize that. And I am very for the state of Texas working in a planning role, working in a partnership role, identifying uh, opportunities for communities to come together, for removing barriers. But the state of Texas does not supply water to one customer. Robert does. And many different, we have about 4,700 water supply uh, districts in the state of Texas today. And the federal government, we know, has a national debt that exceeds our gross domestic product today. I don't think there's going to be many more core lakes funded. Uh, we know the state of Texas has what is it, six lawsuits now for, for education. I think we need to approach this with the mentality that for communities, uh, water is an, a crucial economic development tool. You have to have that available water supply. So if you need water, you need to build that. And we can help do that. But I don't believe that we have to have a tax or a fee levied in order to make that happen. The state of Texas has funded. I've been a part of it my 12 years in the legislature appropriating money for the Water Development Board. There are things that we can do creatively, but to go out there and to say to all the communities in Texas, those 4,700 water districts, sit on your hands, don't worry, the state's going to run to your rescue, that's not a feasible solution. And I think we need to, to encourage partnerships like is occurring all across Texas today. It sounds like Representative Puente wants to say something. And then let me go to Senator Abert, because I think he's going to have a different take on what the commissioner just said. You, you know, we're, we're talking about money, a statewide, a statewide plan, a funding plan for some of these uh, statewide projects, hopefully regional projects. Uh, but gifts, for example, saw as a blank check, and we cannot develop some of these water projects because it is politically too difficult to do. And I'm talking about some uh, about parochialism, about how we feel about, especially groundwater. Um, uh, we had uh, for, uh, ten years ago, 
a 56,000 acre feet of uh, project for water from Gonzales County to San Antonio. Uh, that turned into an 11 acre, 11,000 acre feet project. It's been 10 years since we started that project. We have already spent $44 million on that project and have not one single drop of water to show for it. Uh, hopefully it'll be online by 2013, which is right around the corner, but it gives you an idea that, that money is not uh, uh, the true solution to this. It's a lot of it is just the political problems with transporting water from one area to another, especially groundwater. And it's not where we are taking water, condemning, it is a willing buyer to a willing seller because uh, groundwater is privately owned. So we are looking for and finding uh, lessees, people that will rent their water to us. And so uh, there's that economic uh, relationship. But that blank check will not build these, pro these uh, projects because of the politics involved. Let me ask Senator Abert. Senator Abert, why does the Water Development Board need funding from the legislature? In other words, a lot of the projects that have been built over the last generation have been built with loans from the Water Development Board, money that the board raised by selling bonds. Why can't the people that they make the loans to, why can't they pay off the bonds simply by collecting principal and interest payments from the people that they make the loans to? Why can't the board's infrastructure fund be self-sustaining? Well, actually, uh, to, st to start where uh, Commissioner Staples was, and, and by the way, Commissioner Staples is always correct. <laughs> um, I'm a lobbyist. <laughs> and, a, and a good one. <laughs> um, Actually, you know, you can fund the projects in the, in, the, in the state water plan without increasing taxes or f fees. Um, you will have to re-divert some money from some other source, and I would, I would submit that it's not that much money. The water plan itself, the number that you always hear is $53 billion, but that's $53 billion over 50 years. And if you look at what, the, what is necessary to fund the uh, principal and interest on the money necessary to fund the projects that are ready today, you know, you're in the 100 to $150 million range. And that sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But in the scope of a $80 billion budget, it's really not that much money. So I would submit that it is possible to fund those projects without raising taxes or fees. But I will also submit that if our state is going to attack that problem in an efficient and a business-like manner, the Water Development Board needs to have a revenue stream that it knows how much is coming and when it's coming, because these are 30-year projects that we're talking about building. And, and they can't make long-term decisions from two years at a time, from one legislative session, one appropriation, to the next appropriation. They have to... Uh, have some uh, knowledge of what kind of revenue stream they're going to have into the future if they're going to plan these projects to the highest and best use for our state. If it's going to be done in an efficient manner, prioritized based on where the needs are, then uh, they need a revenue stream. Okay, you're saying they need a revenue stream, but we don't need a fee or a tax, and I'm well, not following you there. Um, you know, the legislature can work miracles. They can do, they can, they can adjust those uh, existing fees and, and revenues that they have today. Or they can create a new one. Um, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to bet any big money that, that they're in the mood to create a new fee or tax these days. I do believe, however, that our legislature is recognizing the uh, importance of implementing the water plan and implementing the water plan, especially, you know, SAWS doesn't need the state of Texas to help finance their projects. Uh, uh, the folks in Dallas and Fort Worth don't necessarily need a lot of help there either, but the folks in Clifton do and the folks in Abilene do. The smaller communities, the rural communities um, and, and others uh, would find that uh, they cannot do their projects without somebody assisting. And let me just make one other point about the, the, the revenue stream. Uh, the local entities are building these projects. These are not state projects. These are local projects. And the financing is, is an assist by the state. So the state will lend the money and those entities will pay it back. Here's the problem. 
if there's no deferral, if there's no uh, 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 subsidy from the state in the form of a deferral, the, the folks in Abilene can't start construction of a uh, multi-hundred million dollar project and start paying it back immediately because they have no revenue to pay for it. If they're allowed to complete the project and then start selling the water to their consumers, then they can pay the, the indebtedness back. And that's really the help that they need. But when the legislature hears deferral, what they're hearing is money. That costs money. It does. And I, I would like to say that, uh, you know, I don't like paying taxes any more than anybody else does, but I don't think this is a situation in which we can take additional revenue off the table. Once again, at the risk of being repetitive, this is about more than just building new stuff. Uh, as the commissioner said, most water infrastructure is built by local government, but the state of Texas, the legislature has put into place a, a couple of key uh, opportunities to address this problem, which it is not funded. One is the Agricultural Land Trust Council created in the General Land Office where landowners are given the opportunity to sell their development rights over critical water areas such as those in San, near San Antonio, and yet it's never funded it. The state of Texas has created a way to protect the environmental flows into places like Matagorda Bay and San Antonio Bay in which most of the water has already been allocated. And so the only way they're going to have those fresh water inflows in the future is to figure out a way to buy them. And so we've got to find revenue to do some of the things, particularly for the environment, that are in fact a statewide responsibility. It's inconceivable to me that we would lose resources like San Antonio Bay or Matagorda Bay, but this issue could bring that about unless we find the revenue to address it. Well, and Andy, I think it's important to point out here, it may not be a tax or a fee, but certainly all these projects are going to drive huge increases in people's utility bills. They're going to be paid for one way or the other. And what the utilities in Texas have said as a matter of this planning is, look, we can fit, we can foot a big piece of this $53 billion bill, and local utilities know they will. San Antonio Water System will pay for some of its projects. But they've also said there's about $27 billion of this that we're going to need some help from the state with. So when we talk about who's going to pay for what, every last bit of this is going to be paid for by citizens of Texas. It's just a question of whether or not it's your utility bill or a new fee or a tax. But all of these things are going to get paid for. And I think the state has a, a de definite role. But you asked the question of the 500-something projects, what's realistic? I believe the state water plan has about 26 plan reservoirs mm -hmm. that are a part of the regional water plan groups. Right. Do we, any of us think maybe 10% of those m might get constructed? I mean, so my point is, as good as this is, and as, as far as advanced as, as it is, as Senator Avett mentioned earlier about the best in the world, it is a moving target. It is one that continues to be refined, um, and technology is leading the way. Agriculture takes a lot of hits. Mm -hmm. about how much water that is used. Since 1970, the irrigated water usage has been pretty constant, but the yields have been double in corn, double in cotton. We've got Texas A&M, Texas Tech University that focus on uh, 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 Texas State that does great research about uh, better water technology. We've got companies like Monsanto and Syngenta and Pioneer and Bayer that are doing great work. So agriculture is contributing greatly, and I believe the water conservation part, we account for the biggest, mm -hmm. biggest amount of conservation that's going to be used in the future. I believe that Commissioner Staples has made an extremely good point, and that is that one of the issues with the state water plan is that it's not really vetted. Uh, it, it, it comes from, through, thanks to Senator Brown, one of the most enlightened processes of any state in the United States. But there are projects in there that are inconsistent among the 16 regional planning groups. There's no process to, to decide which are more cost effective or provide more water than others. Uh, it is said uh, that any new reservoir in Texas constructed west of I-35 would actually lose more by evaporation than it would gain. And so there's issues involving the plan itself that probably we owe the citizens of Texas a better review before we begin to try to figure out a way to come up with $53 billion. This might be a good time 
uh, for me to say, at least on my part, first applause line of the night, uh, that any criticism of the plan of the Water Development Board, at least for my part, is not directed at staff of Water Development Board, which I have, uh, I have heard nothing but good things about. And, and the, the critique of the water plan is uh, about decisions that have been made or not been made at the policy making level, at the very highest level, not, not at the people that, I say this as someone whose wife once worked at the Water Development Board, not, not at the level of people who are actually putting this plan together. Um, let me just, let's, let's turn the page a little bit and talk about agriculture just for a minute. It's come up several times. Um, I just put in a cough drop and I apologize for that, but it's better than coughing. Um, Especially since I'm sitting next to you. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Um, Commissioner, I know this is right in your wheelhouse, but I want to direct it to Laura and then I want to have you do a rebuttal if a rebuttal is called for. Um, a farmer growing just two sections of corn uses as much water as Ozarka bottles in the entire, entire state of Texas in a year. And you know that we are growing a lot more than two sections of corn in the state of Texas. And most of that corn is grown in the panhandle where it rains about 20 inches a year. And water, corn is a very water intensive crop. We know that the Ogallala Aquifer where they are getting that water is being mined, which is to say it is going away and will not come back. And we know that because it's in the water plant. We also know that downstream of Austin, a handful of rice farmers are using approximately three times as much water to grow rice as the city of Austin, a city of one million people, uses every year. And so my question is, is that sustainable? Or are we heading towards a future in which agriculture and municipal uses are inherently in conflict? Well, I think, uh, I don't think we can afford to head into a future where we put those two uses in conflict. Um, our state relies on agriculture as an important block of its economy. I think that, uh, I think the real question is, are we going to have the discipline to not let that become a source of conflict? And I think there are ways that we can do that. There have been huge gains in agriculture in terms of driving that water use down and making sure that every drop of water that's used to grow a crop is used efficiently and effectively. But we can do more. Um, and I think, you know, we're a solutions-oriented panel, and I think right now there's just a real obvious solution out there. The State Water Development Board already has some money in place. One of its many loan programs is designed to work with farmers in Texas in order to look at their irrigation systems and look at those channels and find ways using technology to more efficiently use water for those crops. And it's in that loan program should be the biggest loan program in the Texas Water Development Board. In fact, I think if we were to take a look at all of those monies, we could take the first step to what Andy Sansom just talked about, which is the state already invests in water in, this, uh, in, in a whole variety of programs. Why wouldn't we take that group of programs and reprioritize them so that they're solving the biggest problems first? And so I think that we will probably get to a point in this state where some crops become ungrowable, um, but there's a lot of stuff we can do before we get to that point where we can start really, really optimizing water use. And having grown up in Austin and, you know, heard for years the debate between the city of Austin and the rice farmers, I just think it's the wrong conversation. The first conversation is how can we get that water back into the system that we know is being lost in agriculture? And I just don't think that needs to be a fight. I think that's going to be something that we use incentives for. I think that's something, I think that's a perfect role for the state to play is helping to drive solutions in that arena. That's great. That's a, 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 absolutely the right direction that we have to go is developing those partnerships and finding those solutions. And I mean, the consequences of not having domestically grown food, and Austin certainly appreciates locally sourced products. I might add, go Texan every chance you get to put that little commercial in here. Um, the alternative is to rely on countries that do not have the same environmental standards that we have, that don't have the, the, the good agricultural practices that our producers employ. And so finding those ways in agriculture continues to lead in conservation techniques is absolutely the right, and, and uh, finding solutions together. So the, the answer is there, and we're going to move toward, forward, forward toward it. So how do we get farmers to do that? How do we get farmers to do what Laura just described? Well, farmers are doing it every day with investments that they've had themselves. Um, um, drip irrigation, uh, using satellite imagery today. The Emerging Technology Fund granted like a $250,000 grant for a Lubbock-based company 
that is using satellite imagery and expanding that concept and that technique to make it available to uh, farmers. Precision agriculture uh, is a very big thing today. If you haven't been on a farmer ranch lately, I encourage you to go because they have led the way, our uh, nation's farmers and ranchers, in finding newer and better ways to make our food more affordable and more reliable. And uh, Americans spend the lowest amount on food than, than any other country in the world today. So the loan programs, the partnerships are, are all there. And continuing to encourage private industry to develop those concepts that, that I talked about a little bit earlier. And I think part of the what we see all over the country and really all over the world is you got to get the economics right on those things. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is those solutions are capital intensive. And so what we've got to do is we've got to find a way to incent the agricultural community to invest in those programs and those changes in technology. And it's really not that different than the deferred loan program for a city that's building a water utility to provide for a growing population. There's a recognition that to absorb the rates for that capital investment on year one is too overwhelming. And it's just, you, you know, you use that same thinking in agricultural and you recognize you can't charge those uh, industries year one for the full cost of replacing that equipment. So if we look at these loan programs and redesign them so that they become economically um, attractive to the agricultural community, then they will be used more often. By the way, Nate, <clears throat> we're doing that already in San Antonio. We pay farmers, uh, two counties to the west, U Valley, Medina County. Uh, we pay for their water conservation measures. Uh, it saves water, they keep half of it, and we keep the other half of the water. Perfect. Uh, we pay farmers to not irrigate during dry years. And I'd be remiss if I didn't remind everyone, a company just invested $45 million in Texas. They built a 30-acre uh, greenhouse that has 30 times the yield of field-grown tomatoes, mm -hmm. high quality. They use 86% less water. That's an example of village farms that made that investment here. Let's go back uh, to something that Andy has touched on twice, but we haven't really engaged the panel on, and that's the subject of environmental flows. Can you first, Andy, tell those who aren't familiar in the audience what that term means, and then tell us about that stakeholder process that you recently were involved in, and what was the result of it? Environmental flows are those flows which sustain our aquatic ecosystems. When we speak of it, freshwater inflows, that means the amount of fresh water flowing down the Colorado, the Nueces, the Guadalupe, the other rivers of Texas that causes the unique ecosystem to occur in our bays and estuaries. That's a freshwater inflow. An in-stream flow is that amount of water, say, that's flowing between uh, Austin and Bastrop that supports the aquatic ecosystem upstream in our rivers and streams. Up until Senate Bill 3, Thank you, Senator. The state provided virtually no provision for protecting those flows, such that after all of the other economic uses were made of our surface water in Texas, there would still be uh, sufficient water flowing down our streams and into our bays and estuaries to maintain that system. Senate Bill 3, which many of us were involved in, provided a system for both a scientific and stakeholder-based process, basin by basin, to set environmental flow standards. And thus far, we've been through, I think, four river basins. The state, uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality has done a really inadequate job of supporting those stakeholder and scientifically driven processes in order to set adequate standards for environmental flows. Why isn't there a section in the 2012 water plan on environmental flows? You, know, you can read through this whole thing and there doesn't seem to be. I think that's a, I, I believe that, I hope everyone in the room heard the question. Why doesn't the Texas water plan uh, include provisions for environmental flows? And frankly, in my judgment, that is a flaw. That uh, while we talk about providing water for all of the economic uses, which are so critical to our society and, and economy, we should also make provisions up front to provide flows for the environment. Water is the one substance that we cannot live without. No person, no plant, no animal can live without water. And all of those issues should be addressed in adequate water planning and financing. Um. 
And he has a monopoly on the <laughs> applause lines. We know who the crowd favorite is. And Senator Everett on the laugh lines. Um, let's go back to one other thing that, that Andy also brought up that we, we didn't sort of take off and run with. He suggested that the way that we allocate water, the water rights system, is antiquated, that it's outdated, that it needs to be updated. Why don't we spend a few minutes thinking big? We have the talent at this table to do it. And think about what a more modern system of allocating water rights would look like. I mean, don't spend a few minutes thinking about it. Let's spend a few minutes actually talking about it. Well, it's a, that'd be an, a virtually impossible task. I don't know how they did it back in the 1960s, except for they were coming off of a seven-year drought, and water was uh, obviously, matter of fact, that's when the legislature finally got jiggy with it and started building water projects. <laughs> um, but that's when they did the appropriation of water based on historical use. And a lot of things have changed since the 60s. Uh, there's no mechanism in, in there for updating to highest and best use Matter of fact, there are, uh, there are restrictions from changing from one use to another, uh, which probably needs to be addressed. That's something that probably could be addressed, but it, it's, a, it's an extremely tough issue. And if you want to stir it a little bit more, uh, why don't we allocate groundwater? Okay, let's, yeah, let's do that next. That's yeah, what I was going to uh, mention. There are two different sets of rules, one for surface water, one for groundwater. Uh, the state of Texas, uh, TCQ, sets those groundwater rules, uh, excuse me, surface water rules, but groundwater rules are set by uh, groundwater districts, and every legislative year, despite Senator Brown and Senator Averitt's attempts and my attempts not to have so many, new ones are created, and they're created along county uh, lines. Aquifers obviously do not recognize those political boundaries, and so you have a parochial system. Uh, for example, uh, you need a permit to uh, drill wells and take water out of the ground. Fine, that's a regulation. You also need a different permit to uh, move that water out of the county. Oftentimes, especially in San Antonio circumstance, that permit is five years. It's for five years. And we're sus supposed to spend over $100 million on a five-year permit. Who's going to do that? Well, we're going to do that. We're doing that uh, because we have at least some confidence that we can renew that permit. And so those, those rules uh, by groundwater districts, unfortunately, are parochial. And these are locally elected officials. And you do not get reelected by saying, let's move some of that water to that big city so they can irrigate their lawns. That's, they're going to get defeated. <laughs> and they should. They should uh, recognize that that's a political office. And so we need to look at groundwater districts, look at the rulemaking authority that they have, uh, look at the fact that a lot of their decisions are meant just to leave that water in the ground. We're building a, a, a brackish desalinization plant in Bear County. Ideally, it was, should have been located right across the county line in Atascosa County, but they ran us out. And I'm, I'm talking ran us out. We joined their Chamber of Commerce, gave a contribution to a parade. The next day, the headline <laughs> was, saw us trying to buy uh, chamber officials. That was the headline. Um, you, well, you also don't get reelected to one of those groundwater conservation districts if you say no to a permit applicant in that district. And, and that's the key. It's, is the, uh, it's a willing buyer, willing seller, private property right that you cannot regulate to the extent that it's water left in the ground. And there's enough protections in there to where that county does have water there for its growth, for its future growth, uh, whether it's agriculture or, or the city, the smaller town that's located in there. So there's adequate protections. Unfortunately, since it's an elected body, uh, they cater to who is loudest, and those that are loudest are the ones that don't want that movement of water. I'm told that there's 21 different, correct me if I'm wrong, conservation districts that have some jurisdiction over the Carissa Wilcox <laughs> aquifer. Is that, is that right? Uh, that's right. And not only are we talking about two sets of rules, but we're talking about two different types of water, fresh water and brackish water. Nobody wants that brackish water. Uh, the farmers don't want it. Uh, the only ones that can take advantage of it are big cities like San Antonio that, again, have the rate base to develop that resource. So this brackish plant that we, were, that we are building in, in San Antonio, there's not a groundwater district in, in San Antonio, so, th so uh, all we have to worry about is desired future conditions. That's a whole other subject. Um, and those that are laughing are water geeks, because <laughs> uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so it's, it's just a, a, uh, a bureaucratic political 
situation that I take a lot of responsibility for because I served in the legislature and I can criticize my colleagues uh, because I have that license now. We have that license now and so does Buster Brown. So he's a former state rep, former state senator. Uh, but these are all issues that uh, need to be addressed. And as Jake said, we have to have the political will to address them. But, but Robert, don't you think that that bureaucratic barriers is kind of intended in some way so that there has to be obstacles before big decisions are made? Don't you think that that, that is inherent and part of the process? By the way, Todd's an Aggie and he's from East Texas and he really does talk that way. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, Todd, I wouldn't call them uh, obstacles. They are obstacles. They should be regulations, but they're, they're obstacles. Well, uh, certainly they're obstacles, but I think there, there is a reason that we have a process to where people can have input into it until it, the system slows down until you gain the adequate information that you need. Um, we have a, a great deal of maturity that has to occur uh, with our water laws and our water movement. And I, I, I think we've seen that. We've seen some, some great partnerships develop. But I think along with that maturity on how that we arrive there is from information and science about the movement of water and the Kona Depression. And we can be in the same aquifer, and you can be pretty close to one another, but you, the wells have dramatically different impact on that water availability. So. A lot of those areas don't have access to that information. That's one of the good ways I think that the state can help partner is to provide that hydrological information to make good decisions on. You're absolutely right, Todd, uh, about science and regulations, but explain why uh, the, the city of Schertz and San Antonio sought a permit from the Gonzales Groundwater District. Uh, they got theirs seven years ago. It took us 10, 10 years to get it. They got it in about uh, less than three years. The reason they got their permit much quicker than us is because they are not saws. And what ended up happening, they built their pipeline from Gonzales County to Schertz, which is a suburb of San Antonio, and water was flowing through there. And you talk about partnerships. Um, we finally reached a partnership with, with Schertz Seguin, uh, where we are essentially renting their excess capacity in their pipeline, taking advantage of the already built pipeline, didn't have to build our own pipeline, they are lowering their water rates because of the <laughs> revenue flow they're getting from SAWS uh, because of our uh, partnership. So the, the science, uh, I agree with, you should look at science. I agree there should be regulations, but it should not be those uh, non-explainable uh, overnight cutting in half of your permit that happened to SAWS, and that's what happened to SAWS. You know, I'm, I'm not smart enough to figure out most of that, but Here's a here's a here's my here's my USA Today version. <laughs> the Blanco River starts out in Kendall County on the other side of Fredericksburg and it flows southeastward toward Hayes County where I work. And somewhere in that passage, most of the water in the Blanco goes back into the aquifer from the riverbed. It flows underground to a lovely spring called Jacob's Well. And it comes back up out of the ground and it flows <laughs> down Cypress Creek through the villages of Wood Creek and Wimberley and back into the Blanco. If you tried to get a permit from the TCEQ today to take water out of the Blanco to any extent, you probably couldn't get it. And you'd spend years and thousands of dollars to try to do it. But if you want to go up above Jacob's well and drill a well in the ground and take the same water out, you can pump just about as much as your man and woman enough to pump without any regulation at all. And I do not believe that that system can su sustain us. We, have, we can't have it both ways. We have to begin managing this resource as if it were the same resource rather than two completely different substances. I think, I think ahead, Andy sir. should run for office. <laughs> you're, you're getting all the applause. Uh, or let's, let's just let's take it one step further. Andy, you could also, if you were a billionaire whose last name is Pickens, <clears throat> buy enough water ranches to pump enough water uh, out of the Ogallala to run who knows how many farms dry. You could run whole counties dry, in theory, if you could find a willing buyer for that water. Well, I certainly believe that private landowners need to know who they talk to when their water goes away. Uh, picture a, a landowner in the hill country who's lived on their property for four or five generations, got a spring that takes care of their cattle and 
provides a benefit to their family and because of the actions of the local groundwater management district, the spring goes away. Those people know who, they need to know who to talk to to, to, to d address the fact that they have been damaged. And I don't think there's any question about that. Senator Abert, what would happen if you were back in the Senate and you told that story that Andy just told and said now it's time to do something, it's time to totally change the way we regulate groundwater? Well, I, I'd probably get unelected, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll say this about that. Uh, people's attitudes change uh, and, 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 and our, our society progresses. Uh, I'm fond of, of saying that uh, 30 years ago, if you were concerned about the environment, you were a communist and you could not get elected to public office. Today, however, if you're not concerned about the environment, you are a goober <laughs> and you can't get elected to public office. People in our state are concerned about the quality of their water and their air uh, and preserving the natural beauty of Texas and <laughs> it manifests itself in many different ways. But uh, I think that the attitude of, of uh, the f folks in, in Texas are that we have something special here and and we're waking up to the fact that we have to uh, be protective of it, and, and uh, we're calling on our leaders to do that. And uh, Andy is a great mind as far as, uh, you know, uh, talking about the, the big picture items that uh, the legislature uh, leadership have not addressed. I would say they didn't, they, it hasn't been ignored, it just hasn't been addressed yet. And as, as has been stated uh, here, uh, previously, it's a function of guts and political will to do these things. But uh, we're all veterans of that process, and we know that, uh, and it's maddening, but it takes time. It takes a long time to make progress in, in these areas. I did not answer the question on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of, of, uh, of political will uh, and leadership, it, it strikes me, I, you know, I was not here during the drought of the 50s, but it strikes me that, that our reaction to that crisis as a community was decidedly different than the one that we're having to the 2011 drought, which, also, which was the single worst 12-month period in the history, the recorded history of Texas. Um, it just seems like We've entered a different era, and I wonder if we haven't left behind that time when we could rally together as a community and say, it's time to make a major investment in, in public infrastructure. Because after all, the, the response to the drought of the 1950s, when you look at it in the rearview mirror, was overwhelming. We built 126 reservoirs between 1957 and 1980. It's hard to imagine us doing something like that today. And I know this is a really open-ended question, but for those of you that have served in the legislature, what does it mean? Does it feel to you like we're in a different era when it comes to that sort of all-hands-on-deck commitment to sort of the public good? I, I think Texans get it. I mean, I, I, I sense that they are very concerned, but they also want to know what the specifics are and what the end use is going to be. I mean, the Texas Water Smart Coalition in their survey and trying to find out what messages work and will motivate people to action found that Texans believe that they have a responsibility to help with this problem, and, and that's why the conservation message is working today, and we're seeing phenomenal results. Uh, so... I, I think the will is there. I, I think the will to fight about what the right answer is also there. And I, and I think through that process, you, you end up making certain we don't go out there and try to spend the money to build 526 projects, but we focus on those that are at hand. And planning is important. Doing is better. And so we just have to find what those are and 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 then have the recognition that the community has a responsibility themselves to take care of their own needs, and, and we'll get it done with, with, with a lot of good partnerships is the way I see it. How about our other two former legislators? I, I would just hold out SAWS and El Paso, for that matter, as examples 
of how the issue can be addressed reasonably and responsibly without baking, breaking the back of their ratepayers. Uh, they have done uh, um, a miraculous work out of necessity. Uh, the folks in San Antonio were uh, a federal judge put the gun to their head and it told them they had to do it. And there was a lot of moaning and gnashing of teeth at the time, but as it turns out, it's been a blessing for those folks. Um, they have very competitive water rates and their consumption is down, so they're not spending as much money on water as the rest of the state is. And uh, it's all because of, uh, you know, some progressive leadership and, uh, and the will to do, and, and, and I, I keep going back to this, but the fact that they look at water uh, and conservation in a business sense, and that is they put a value on that and they pay for it. So nothing is free, but conservation is cheap. One of the things I think needs to, to be said about that, and I agree with everything the Senator just said, is that it, it's going to take a kind of an engineering culture change to understand that an investment in conservation can often be far more efficient than an investment in traditional water supply infrastructure such as reservoirs. Many of us recently heard in this town a speech by the uh, Pat Mulroy, who's the director of the Southern Nevada water authority where they are in an incredible fix over there and the city of las vegas has spent 400 million dollars in the last 20 years or so buying people's lawns back if you live in las vegas you can sell your lawn to the city by the square foot meaning you take it out of irrigation and by that device that expenditure has produced far more water than a traditional infrastructure expenditure would have done. And that's what they're doing in San Antonio and El Paso, and it's working. By the way, Andy didn't serve in the legislature, but he uh, <laughs> went ahead and answered it, but very good answer. Um, uh, and by the way, El Paso and San Antonio have the two lowest uh, water rates in our entire state. Um, but you talk, you talk about political will. Um, the state of Texas uh, legislature won't even fund public education. They're not going to fund a statewide water plan. Now you're messing. <laughs> uh, they won't. Uh, Governor Perry has said he will not sign a tax bill, whether it's water, transportation, anything. So it's not going to get funded unless there's a, a, a understanding of what the true value of water is. And we don't really appreciate the value of water, Every, especially those of us that have children how much do we pay for our cell phone? It is more than we pay for our monthly water bill. So we have no, no true value of what water is. So I think we really do need um, a drought of record type of scenario. I don't think Buster, despite his great legislative um, talents, could have passed Senate Bill 1 if it hadn't been for the drought of the mid-1990s. Uh, and that got a lot of people's attention. And by the way, we had a budget surplus during that year, and we were able to fund all these uh, regional water groups that, makes this, that make these uh, state water plan. Um, so it's, it's, it's very difficult. In the House, you have the much smaller districts where uh, the, the, the uh, representative uh, has to be responsive to his constituents, and his constituents do not want that water leaving whether it's surface water or groundwater, leaving that area. And if you're from East Texas, you will not win your re-election if you advocate the, the uh, repeal of junior water rights. They will not happen. Um, and so these are political decisions that have to come from the very top. You have to have some, almost another crisis like the, uh, the drought of last year to where we really start appreciating what we have and acting accordingly. And for me, it is the political changes that are necessary, the political will to get some of these things done that we need to do. I think uh, Robert and Kip would agree with me that in addition to Buster's great legislative talent, in addition to the drought of the 90s, the third factor was named Bob Bullock. Um, did I just hear somebody about to say something? No. Um, Earlier, Commissioner uh, Staples said that we may not want to build all 500 projects in here, but we have to find a way to prioritize, uh, to strategize. Is that a, a shortcoming 
of the 2012 water plan, that it doesn't really identify which are the most crucial. It doesn't pass judgment on any of these projects. How many of those projects are uh, recycled uh, systems? How many of those projects are aquifer storage and retrieval systems? Um, you talk about, uh, somebody had a quote here of how much evaporation there is, I think it was you, Andy, of, of um, reservoirs built west of I-35 lose more to, air, uh, to evaporation than what the ultimate consumer is. But our ASR is an underground lake. We do not lose a drop of it to evaporation. Uh, so it's storage. It's huge, huge storage. Uh, direct recycle. Every time we flush a toilet, uh, take a shower, use the sink, that water is collected, cleaned up, and put back into our system. Not to drink, but for irrigation, for manufacturing. Uh, every Toyota uh, truck driven out there has uh, San Antonio DNA in it. So you, you, I'm glad you got that. Uh, so uh, maybe it's, it's, the, it's the types of projects that are in there that we have to look at. I think probably the shortcoming of the state water plan is that it has, there's, it has no priority, there's no criteria for which comes first, which comes second. It is in essence a capital improvement program uh, to draw on. In fact, it's got 500 some odd projects in it. That is not something that can't be fixed. And in fact, you know, if you think about the key roles that the state needs to play, I think the themes are emerging on the panel. There are lots of things that cities can and will do, like San Antonio, like El Paso, but there are some things that cities are ill-equipped to do that only the state can do. And helping to prioritize that plan to make sure that the most important projects happen first is one of those things. Making sure that conservation is built into those projects so that it's not just a box you check, but it's a program that you do that delivers actual results. There's no question that it's gonna to have to be the state's role to reconcile the difference in how we govern ground and surface water. And there's really no question that it's gonna be a state role to reconcile the fact that we've got a state water plan that doesn't talk to us, uh, the process that determines how much flow we need in our rivers and streams, and we've gotta reconcile those two things. So the water plan can help with each and every one of those reconciliation processes. But the state has to engage in a discussion to do that. And the state's best way of doing it is to create a funding source that starts to drive smart money into these solutions. Um, we have uh, a little time left for some questions from the audience. There's, there's two microphones, one in each aisle here. I'd encourage anybody who'd like to ask one of our panelists a question now would be a good time to do that. Hello. Oh, uh, yes, go ahead, sir. <laughs> yeah, my name is Aaron Yule. I work with LaRouche Pact, and I would like to put a proposal on the table for all of you, which is a much grander proposal than just simply the Texas drought problem. There's a much bigger drought problem that goes all the way up to Colorado, all the way up, and you're talking about uh, forest fires, all kinds of things breaking out uh, now up in Colorado and other places. But what would you say to the fact that if there was a plan that could bring 16 million acre feet of water a year into the Rio Grande Basin area. Now, there, it's a shocking amount of water uh, to bring down into this area. Now, John Kennedy, one of the greatest leaders of our country, understood that the problems of the states and municipalities went bigger, and he did a whole project orientation re research, and he hired the Parsons Company to do an investigation of how we would do something of that magnitude. And he came up with a program which we are organizing across the nation to make a national policy. It's called NAWAPA, N-A-W-A-P-A. -A -A. Uh, Andrew, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I want to make sure you have a, a question for one of our panelists. I do. OK. Can you, can you ask that question now? Yes. It, in terms of this project, which will bring water from Alaska down into the entire United States, it's a huge project. Uh, what would you guys say to actually orienting the whole nation for something on a much grander scale and bringing this kind of project into being? I have a report right, which you can look over and stuff of that nature. Would anybody like to tackle that question? <laughs> I think it's just a matter of economics because in the 50s they had plans to move water laterally from mm -hmm. the eastern states into Texas and so uh, if the economics work, I think you can get the will to get serious about it. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate the question. Aaron. Aaron, I'm sorry, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. 
Uh, yes, sir, over here on the yeah, right. Yeah, I'm Bill Bunch with Save Our Springs Alliance here in Austin. Uh, thank you all for this great discussion, especially, Andy, your, your comments about leading us to focus our spending on protecting our watersheds and our rivers and bays and estuaries, because it seems to me that's where we really have to go. All of these development projects have tremendous financial costs as well as environmental costs, with the exception of conservation. The state water plan has a single paragraph dedicated to conservation, even though all the experts agree that is the cheapest and most reliable place to go, and y'all have pretty much confirmed that. Uh, my question for the panel is, in 2004, there was an interim study where there was a consensus recommendation that all of our cities should move expeditiously towards at least or no more than 140 gallons per capita per day uh, total use. Um, San Antonio's already there. Austin's getting close. El Paso's there. And that was a water development study, right, Bill? That's water correct. Development board. Yeah. But the water plan says nothing about that and is still planning that especially Dallas-Fort Worth will be wasting a ridiculous amounts of water into the future and other urban areas too, but especially it's worse in Dallas-Fort Worth. So my question for the panel is would y'all support aggressively going back to the wisdom of that study and pushing our cities uh, to save billions of dollars, save our rivers and bays, and, and focus first priorities on getting below that 140 GPCD goal. I, I think in our opening statements, every one of us talked about how important water conservation is and how it is a, not only a, a water supply, but uh, uh, business-wise, it's wise for for private industry, it's wise for the utility itself, it's wise for the ratepayer. So I, I don't think there's anyone here that would not support it. I don't want to speak to everybody, obviously. What happened to that that study of that, that produced this number, 140 gallons per person per day? You, are, is anyone on the panel familiar with that study? Do you remember when that was done? It went to Senator Avick's committee <laughs> and died. <laughs> <laughs> Never, never mind. <laughs> no, let me just say one thing about that. Uh, last session, we did have a proposal to have a carve out of any monies dedicated to funding the state water plan that uh, X percent of that, I think, uh, I don't remember if it was 10 or 20, it was a healthy number, would be dedicated to conservation efforts. I mean, I'll tell you one thing that happened with that report was the state didn't have a standardized metric to even compare Dallas to San Antonio to El Paso. So one important thing that happened last session is a law did pass that created a standardized, me a standardized methodology so that we can figure out how everybody's arriving at their numbers. And so we will, for the first time ever as a state, even have the ability to compare city to city. And, and maybe we need to do a better job celebrating the successes that we have had. And, and North Texas has had some phenomenal gains from implementing conservation measures when you can postpone and delay an infrastructural project by 15 years because <laughs> your water supply has been stretched through <coughs> conservation techniques, so. And yet there are still challenges in the Metroplex. I think I remember reading sure. about an Arlington City Council meeting in which they proposed, just two weeks after Dallas successfully passed an ordinance to limit watering permanently to two days per week brought it up at the Arlington City Council, they were essentially shouted down, it was called anti-American, and they didn't even vote on it. <laughs> That's There's still challenge. neighbors out there. We have another question over here on the left. Uh, lady and gentlemen, my name's Jimmy Hill. I am from Round Rock. Um, seems to me we've got two absolutely huge resources in this state. The first one is the Gulf of Mexico. The second one is sunlight. We have an awful lot of solar energy coming into this state. There are technologies out there such as multi-stage dehumidification, humidification type solar, uh, solar water distillation that can, I don't know how economical it is, but it can sure make an awful lot of fresh water out of seawater. Why aren't we doing more to use our resources in the Gulf of Mexico? Can I? Sir, go ahead. At our wastewater treatment plant, we have cited a solar farm that's going to produce enough electricity to run, run that water treatment plant, our desalinization plant, and our ASR. So on solar energy, uh, with the help of our sister agency, CPS Energy, we are doing that. 
Uh, there's no reason to go to the coast as far as San Antonio is concerned. We are for, it's too expensive for us. It is uh, about 300 times more expensive than some of our current water supplies. Uh, so it makes absolutely no economic sense for us to do it. Additionally, I don't know why anyone throughout South uh, cent Central all the way to Arkansas would do that because there's already a gulf, an ocean of brackish water right under Texas where you don't have to go to the coast. It's a brackish water. Uh, we just need to tap that resource. We don't need to go all the way to the Gulf. If you carry a bucket of water, you know how heavy it is. Water is very heavy. Uh, essentially, you'd have to move that water uphill, a lot of energy, not just to treat it, but to move that water. So for, for San Antonio and most cities, it's not economically feasible to do it yet. But it's a good question, and it comes up every single time, is we don't really have a water shortage. We just need to figure out how to get the salt out of it. And as we stand here today, the, you know, the best answer is it's the most expensive water supply you could create, and it is also the most energy intensive water supply you could create. We didn't spend a lot of time talking about the water energy nexus, but before we go to the most expensive, highest energy use water, there are lots of less expensive options that we should pursue. Brackish desal is one of them. Uh, the other thing is just a statement here. I think that we would be really in sad shape if we went the same way as California and went with uh, a program of interbasin transfers because all that does is cause hate and discontent between landowners and the large water municipalities. And I know you've all seen uh, Chinatown talking about the dynamiters out there. They got so upset over their water being stolen from the Owens Valley that they blew up the aqueduct repeatedly. And I just, I don't like the thought of uh, that sort of thing happening here. People may not have access to dynamite, but they've got bobcats and uh, <laughs> D9 bulldozers and a lot of things where they can damage uh, aqueduct and pipeline systems. I think they do have dynamite in Palestine last time. <laughs> uh, over here on the right, please. Okay, um, I have two questions. Uh, why not make it personal and give breaks to people who um, build rainwater collection systems in every foundation? <clears throat> rainwater collection, we haven't well, talked about that yet. We're a water utility, we do. Um, there are some rebates for those types of programs at the San Antonio Water System. The unfortunate thing about it is it's very expensive, especially for existing structures. The time to do it is when new homes are being built. I believe there's enough of a demand by our public, even though it'll cost more, your, cost, your, your, your new purchase will cost more to have catchment systems. Uh, the big problem is though, if it doesn't rain, there's nothing in that cistern. And so you have to have a backup supply, which is the water utility. So that's why a lot of water utilities are not that enthused about it because you get to get the, the rainwater and, and use that, and you should, but you also need to recognize that there is a water utility out there that needs to serve as your backup. So Robert's, Robert's point is very well taken. We at Texas State University are now working on a potential uh, establishment of rainwater collection systems on a subdivision scale at the, big, at the time the subdivision is built. And it's much more feasible than trying to go back in and retrofit older buildings. Now we're getting wonky. Did you have a second question? Yes. Um, also, in my education, is there any reason that I am not being taught about any of this? <laughs> <laughs> That is an outstanding At the risk question. of heresy in this room, you might consider Texas State University. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, sir, on the left. Can yes, you top I'm that? Philip Russell from Austin, and as I drive around Austin, I'm struck by the number of acres of St. Augustine grass that are maintained by the state of Texas and symbolism is important. And has anybody ever considered practicing what <coughs> we preach and using that as a symbol to make people aware that uh, there's better ways to cover your lawn than with St. Augustine? 
Should the South Lawn of the Capitol be zero escape? That is the question. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Aver. Well, the answer is no. <laughs> Anybody else? You know, in all seriousness, Laura, can you tell us the percentage of municipal water use that goes onto lawns? In the summer, it's the lion's share in the residential water use. I mean, if you want to, if you want to tackle waste and losses in the municipal sector, you're definitely going to have some irrigation ordinances, and we're all going to have to adjust our aesthetic away from St. Augustine grass and towards other kinds of landscape. I worry a little bit that so often this conversation in cities settles exclusively on residential users. There are non-residential users in cities that are every bit as important, and we need to work on ways to create incentives or uh, rate structures that um, also get conservation out of the non-residential customers. And, and I will say this, there has been far too little done with rate structures in this country to find ways to incent conservation among people like you. Most conservation rate structures create a disincentive for people who use an enormous amount of water, but they don't do anything for families like yours and ours that are working hard every year to, every year to use a little bit less water. And the truth is, we've already got an analog in electric utilities. An electric utility, if you put a solar panel on your roof, that utility considers you to have sold back energy to this grid, and it gives you some sort of rebate recognizing that you've sold back. You could use that same logic in cities and actually create in conservationists out of every citizen in the city, and you could do the same thing with the businesses. But again, though, you're talking about a utility that has to change its ethic. They have to believe that it is in their best interest to sell less of the product that they were created to sell. And actually, SAWS has given a gift to this state because SAWS is out there saying, you know, we've run the economic analysis on a true conservation rate structure, and the truth is, if you look at the avoided cost of future water supplies and pushing projects down the line, it does not cost a utility to do conservation. And I think that's a super important contribution that that utility has made to the state. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, on the left. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is uh, Bob Eskridge in Round Rock. Um, one of the areas we touched on briefly is on the residential side. I, I remember reading a statistic somewhere where uh, the number of houses that are going to be built by 2030 is going to more than double in the state of Texas. It seems like there's a golden opportunity to work with the planning and zoning commissions to incorporate a number of these conservation methods uh, into, this, into the new housing. Somewhere like you have a smart house for technology, have a smart house for water. Is, have you seen anything like that coming down the pike? Uh, in San Antonio, we, I'm sorry, uh, in San Antonio, we have an agreements, uh, they were incentives at the beginning, now they're part of the city ordinance where home builders have to have at least four inches of topsoil before they lay the grass. Uh, they are, uh, now it's, as I mentioned, part of the city ordinance, so yes, there's a lot of those kinds of things that we do already uh, with the Planning Commission or with the Real Estate Council or with the Home Builders Association, what we have learned, you always with, work with them, get them to buy in on it, show them the bottom line to it. They do buy off on it, and then you make it a city ordinance, because there's always the outliers, the people that don't want to uh, do this, because we know it's really for the betterment of the entire community. So we, we're doing it in San Antonio. Uh, yes, sir, on the right. Hi there. <clears throat> Great panel, um, but I want to, on the last thing that, um, Ms. Huffman said that somehow we have to attract the smart money to make these projects possible. Uh, trillions in smart money just evaporated this week uh, around the uh, fixing of LIBOR interest rates. Trillions disappeared with the uh, mortgage bubble blowing up. Uh, and yet, in the old days, um, when NAWAPA, which is the North American Water and Power Alliance, where 40% of the water on the entire continent falls on the western slopes of the Rockies and just in Canada, Alaska, just dumps into the Pacific Ocean and it's salt water and is never used for anything. Um, this project will solve our problem and it can be financed for a fraction of what's been spent bailing out the financial markets. There's a local angle to this, Mr. Puente, because the key proponent of this project uh, Senator Moss from Utah came to San Antonio in the 80s to fight for this thing when Henry Gonzalez was running finance in the Congress, and we were a little bit saner back then. And so um, 
I, I want to invite everyone here to think a lot bigger that we can't let the markets decide whether we have a drink of water for our grandchildren or not. Uh, NAWAPA will solve all these problems and create millions of jobs for a lot of unemployed people. And let's not nickel and dime it on the question of, of um, interbasin transfer. If you let that d define your policy, uh, the Imperial Valley of California would never have happened. Thank you. Thank you. So, for your, what for do your you think comment. about that? Is that is that should we let the markets decide whether we can afford to have water or not for future generations? Would anybody like to comment on that? Let's. Uh, thank you for your for your contribution. And let, now let's take a question from the left side of the room over here. Uh, yes, uh, I just want to thank everybody for speaking with us today. And I have a question for the commissioner. Um, you mentioned earlier the good work that uh, Monsanto is doing in the state of Texas, specifically with corn. Um, as far as the research that I know to be publicly available, Monsanto's Roundup Ready genetically modified corn increases the amount of pesticide used um, by a large percentage, thus destroying the groundwater and the surface water that it runs off into. And I just wanted to hear the commissioner's uh, comments on how that's good work for water and the state of agriculture in Texas. Gosh, we're out of time here. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, no, we're really not out of time. And I, you know, I know there's a lot of concern about things out there um, and they need to be investigated. We have regulatory authorities that investigate when chemicals and herbicides and pesticides are not used in accordance with the label that are approved by our Environmental Protection Agency. People take that seriously and they're looking into that. Uh, I think it doesn't detract from the good work that is being done and when concerns are raised, they're looked at. So thank you for that. What's that good work? Um, I think, I, I don't want to uh, belittle the value of your question, but it doesn't really pertain to the panel that everybody well, else has come here to, to it, listen to. It does to because tonight. those pesticides run off into the water surface water and the groundwater, and this is a water panel, so to the extent we can't that drink that, that water. We I'm can't not, use it for agriculture anymore. I really don't want to interrupt you. To, to the extent that that's true, I, I think our panelists has already answered that question. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, on the right here. Yeah, let's, uh, let's address this brave use question. Um, it seems to be there's some uh, general consensus that um, education towards cultivating uh, an ethic of conservation is important. So how do we do that? That's a good question. Uh, uh, um, we do that in San Antonio. Oh, yes. Going to be uh, when, 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 um, <laughs> um, y'all are come and spend your money in San Antonio. <laughs> uh, and, and by the way, we have a very good basketball team. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, when SALT was created, one of the, uh, or by ordinance, uh, we are required to spend a certain amount of money uh, on youth programs, educational programs. And so we employ uh, an education department there at SALS, uh and we go out into the communities, uh, the schools, and teach water conservation, teach where our water comes, comes from, uh, wastewater, all kinds of uh, issues that this young lady was talking about. But again, those are, um, through the high school uh, um, time, and I think maybe she was talking about more uh, uh, post uh, high school, but we do it in San Antonio. There are also a number of enlightened um, entities that are uh, developing uh, curriculum for elementary and junior high kiddos uh, in, the, um, um, in the Houston and Galveston area where the subsidence district sponsors uh, the development and, and um, implementation of that curriculum throughout the school uh, system down there. I think another issue that's important is to for us to sort of shift our minds away from conservation as some sort of restraint to conservation as a means of producing additional supply. It, we, we think of it somehow in terms of a uh, of a concept that keeps us from doing something or requires sacrifice, when in fact we should be thinking of it as simply another way to provide more water. I think that's a, a great note to end our, our panel on, and I, and I apologize to those who still had questions that hadn't had a chance to ask them. I want to thank our panelists again for participating, and I thought it really went wonderful. I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.